Shenzhen has been an important window in China's reform and opening up, and new guidelines aim to build the southern city into a model of a competitive, innovative, and influential global powerhouse by mid-century, one which fully demonstrates the concept of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Shenzhen will also explore offshore renminbi trading along with the neighboring Hong Kong. So how can this vision for Shenzhen help shape China's economic transformation in the future? How will it boost the Greater Bay Area's integration? And how will Hong Kong's future develop under the one country, two systems principle? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Hong Wei Min, the Hong Kong deputy to the 13th National People's Congress and principal liaison officer for the Hong Kong Shenzhen Qianhai Authority, and He Wei Wen, senior fellow of the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University of China. We'll also speak to Dr. Hai Feng Wu, associate professor of the Shenzhen Finance Institute at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in Sydney via satellite. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to our discussion here, gentlemen. First of all, let's look at the timing, the backdrop against which this, uh, what we call, uh, policy white paper about Shenzhen's future got released. We win. Yes, I think this is a critical time for China. Uh, we noticed that uh, we, are, we have two major steps almost at the same time. First, Shanghai. That's the new zone for Shanghai Free Trade Zone. At, uh, uh, then we have the pilot demonstration zone in Shenzhen for building China socialist, uh, socialist country with uh, Chinese characteristics. So these are two major strategic steps by the Central Committee of the Party and the State Council. That means for Shanghai, it's focused mostly on the reform and opening up. For Shenzhen, it's the building into the modern socialist country is uh, take a pilot zone in Shenzhen first for the whole country. Let's look at the timing, uh, in particular, of uh, the release uh, of this white paper, quote-unquote. Uh, is there anything special about the background and the timing? Well, <coughs> there's actually quite a few speculations in Hong Kong at the timing because of all the turmoils that have happened in Hong Kong in the past two months. But personally, because I also work for the Shenzhen government in a certain extent, so you know I know this thing have been in preparation for more than a year, you know, probably two years, and then also the um, general secretary himself had approved this plan in December last year, and at that time nobody can envision Hong Kong will have what we have today in the situation. I think um, just like what the professor said, I think it is important to this is the, the, the timing wise on a more macro basis. Uh, with the Greater Bay Area blueprint that was, uh, you know, le released earlier this year, is to really to the deepening of the reform and opening up of China. Remember, 40 years ago, Shenzhen was the pilot zone. It was called Special Economic Zone, but it was the pilot zone at that time to try out the new reform and opening. Okay, and it was very successful. And uh, I think reform and opening up is in the blood of Shenzhen people. Okay, now after 40 years, when we are now getting into deeper waters, where we are really want to opening up more, want to um, rebalance between the state and the market, when we think about how to improve business environment, Shenzhen again will take the lead to be the pilot. I think it's just natural. Now, whether, whether this paper came out on this past Sunday or a week before or a week later, mm -hmm. to me, I mean, I, I do not think it means too much. Thank you very much. Let me cross over to uh, Sydney, where Mr. Wu Haifeng is standing by. Hello, Haifeng. What do you think of the timing? Uh, what do you want to say about the uh, special status of Shenzhen at this particular moment? Well, it's uh, 9.30 p.m. in the Sydney night, but I'm still in the studio, and it's my, my pleasure to join you guys. And uh, I just want to emphasize two points this, to this year is the 70 years anniversary for the People's Republic of China and the 41 years anniversary of the opening up policies plus this is the first year of officially launching the 
Great Bay Area policies by central government, so it's quite important. And at this moment, we have seen this such white paper to release to the outside. It shows the people to the world how determined of the central government try to build up the Great Bay Area into a new stage, bring the Great Bay Area into a new stage. Now, obviously, China is facing the downward economic yes. pressure, and the confidence is badly needed, particularly for the uh, private economy to be further developed, other than the issue of uh, regional integration in the Great Bay Area. How serious is the challenge for Shenzhen to play a positive role and to be an example for the rest of the country? Oh, yes, I think Shenzhen has been quite successful in pioneering the whole country in the new part of development and sustainable. And it will still play an important role and a demonstration role for the whole country. Because you see, if we look back the 40 years history of Shenzhen, it's developed almost from scratch. Then it developed by its own because the government had no idea at the very beginning. They just say that you just test, we just open, you just try. So many private and uh, emerging enterprises brought up, including Huawei, Tencent, and so on, so on, Dajiang, and so on and so forth. They developed on their own. So they have the innovation and the pioneering, and the government supported with a new complementary, new. Um, mechanism because there's an, there was, has been no such a government interference or government intention, government support in Shenzhen, only developed by the enterprises themselves. And Shenzhen also opened wide to the world. So Shenzhen has been showing to the whole country mm -hmm. that it can be successful and the country could be successful. An important piece of the experience of Shenzhen is Shenzhen has been been focusing on high-tech innovation and development. So the strategic emerging industries in Shenzhen last year totaled almost 100 billion RMB, 60% larger than Shanghai. So this is quite successful. And this also shows the whole country should follow a <coughs> similar pattern. For years and years, uh, a Cantonese culture which covers uh, broadly Hong Kong and Guangdong, if not Fujian, is known for being less ideologically charged, politically oriented. Uh, the entrepreneurship there uh, is praised and generates uh, headlines of much because of the diligence and innovation of the entrepreneurship. Now, today, the central authorities uh, emphasize overwhelmingly the importance of carrying on the legacy of all the importance of socialism. Socialism with Chinese characteristics. But when you look at the Western media coverage on the image of China, most of the time they call China a communist uh, country, a communist media. But we only say this is a, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. This is not a discussion about ideology, official ideology of China. But I'd like to have your thoughts on how to define this phrase socialism with Chinese characteristics, because this is a, an important label uh, to define the image of our uh, option and what the future might hold for this special place. Well, I think the socialism with Chinese characteristics is still an evolving thing. Okay, it's a, it's a keep on evolving, improving kind of socialism. And one of the major thing is what kind of role does market play? If you look at the earlier days when we talk about socialism with Chinese characteristics, we were also talking about sociali uh, socialist market economy. These two terms came out almost at the same time, and it was d describing almost the same thing. However, you know, in the traditional thinking of socialism, is always like the state control everything, the state owns everything, okay? Market may be just a small supplement. But your so-called traditional way of thinking actually uh, must be looked at in the Chinese context. When you look at Scandinavian countries, when you look at Western European countries uh, and elsewhere in developing countries, uh, the concept of socialism would be very, very different from uh, our understanding, right? Yes, I was talk more talking about textbook socialism, okay? That was, that was in textbook. But today, if you look at, I think, um, this, under Xi Jinping's new era, um, socialism with the Chinese characteristic, one of the key thing is, if you look at some of these papers, is you know let the market play a pivotal role in determination the use of different resources, whereas we still maintain the state 
ownership and supporting of critical um, businesses and functions. Okay, so I think if you look at Shenzhen, which is was a leader and still a leader in you know private economy. I mean, we just talk about technology. Um, the uh, GDP, the, the research spending uh, per GDP, um, it was about 4.2 percent. Okay, uh, on research, of which only about 0 0.9 is from the government. So if you look at Shenzhen, this is a very different kind of kind of you know research and technology compared, with, for example, Beijing. Whereas in Shenzhen, most of the research comes from private enterprises, not from like universities and government. Okay, it comes from the DJI, comes from the Huawei and you know BYD and those, and it serves as a, it's a very good model. I think in the future, this is one of the things we we want to push as well. It's like let the enterprises, let the companies use their resources in the best way to invest, for example, into R&D, invest into businesses, where the government just play a regulatory role instead of government a lot of investment, for example, into, you know, technology. Let me cross over to uh, Haifeng again for his comment on, first of all, uh, the presence of state-owned enterprises in Shenzhen, if any, because the Western media would always be very demanding about uh, uh, differences, if any, uh, between the state-owned enterprises and the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises of the private economy. Um, do you think uh, uh, the, the government will be featured more prominently in running um, the state-owned enterprises uh, as opposed to the small and medium-sized enterprises which help solve the problem of unemployment to a large degree? What do you think? Well, I think the private company does help, but we cannot ignore the effects of the government-owned companies. I don't think they are the com competitors, mutually exclusive competitors. Actually, they help each other. For example, like the Excuse me, when you say they help each other, let, let, let's focus on the issue, the very issue, uh, uh, an issue that has caused a lot of controversies. That's whether the um, uh, non-public enterprises will be able to enjoy equal access to loans. And what do you think of the financial vehicles for the private economy? Do you think they enjoy the same freedom, the same equality with the state-owned enterprises? Well, there is a quite complicity, complicated kind of a model to decide whether we give you a loan or not, like the credibilities, like the assets, like the, like the, the asset backed mortgages. So it's not easy question to say whether, well, it's, 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 it's the, the, the accessible to loan is preferable to the government owned company or private owned company. But having said that, because just getting a loan is one approach to get a funding for coming there are obviously there are other other different methodologies to get the loans. I think for example the, the private fund is one example. I mean government company never uh, actually try to, to get the funding from the private funds but lots of the private company they does enjoy the flexibility flexibility of the, the, the private funds money or capitals. So well it's just not not easy to say whether it's easy to access the loan markets or capital market by mm -hmm. different company, different type type of companies. But I think the special case in Shenzhen is there are a variety of the channels for different type of companies to get different capitals from the markets. So that is my observation in the last two years while I lived in Shenzhen. Whitman, what do you think of his response towards uh, my question about uh, whether there's uh, an equality between the SOE and uh, a private SMEs? I think by observation, uh, it's not. Okay, obviously, large state-owned enterprises will enjoy much better support from traditional finance institutions such as banks, and, but that is understandable. If you look at banks, their business in the, is in the business of risk management. Okay, if you look at the SOE with government backing, large, very large company, rich, large capital um, turnover, of course you give them better rates and you are feel much easier to lend the money. Whereas you look at the SMEs with no government support, with very little asset, and the credit ratings will be low. So it's it's a market decision. Okay, it's not ideal, but it is a market driven thing. Now, of course, I know the central government have been asking the banks to say let's please support more SMEs because they 
they give buoyant economy, they give employment and everything, and also most of the innovation come from small and medium enterprises, and I agree with that. I think what you need to do is create a mechanism so the banks can, ma can you know, manage their risk while still, I mean, I, I, I'm sure they don't have a discrimination um, because it's a state owned, whether it's a private owned. It's more about the size, the asset, and the credit ratings. So what you need to do really is, if you look at the world, it's the same thing. I mean, banks are much more willing to lend to large enterprises than SMEs in Hong Kong, in America, everywhere else. Of course, here it's a bit tricky because you have the state owned you know, uh, thing in there. But the good thing is, if you look at the, uh, America, for example, they have actually a government funded organization that helps. A, 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 it's called Small Business uh, Bureau, Small Business some, SMB, something like that. What they do is they kind of like a, um, they, they offer uh, support, they offer guarantees for certain SMEs in the area, for example, in, in technology and development. Okay, and they also work with uh, venture capital funds so that they can actually help to guarantee and ask the banks to lend money to such small, medium enterprises that are in the up running. Okay, not every SME. Now, we, we, when we are fast entering into a new era of innovation, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and big data. Yes. Uh, when we look into the future, uh, what do you think of the competitiveness of Shenzhen, uh, given the huge success of uh, Tencent and Huawei, exactly in Shenzhen for the past years? Uh, do you think this is likely to be sustained? Uh, yes, I am sure that it will sustain, but we cannot say for 100 percent sure that Shenzhen will continue to be more competitive uh, than other regions. Because if we look at uh, the rankings of the innovative and creative cities worldwide by the Business Insider, then Shenzhen ranked as 20th in the world behind uh, Beijing and Shanghai. And the American cities took six of the top ten. So still, Shenzhen has a large room for improvement. As far as artificial intelligence, big data, there is a very strong competition in China, among Chinese cities. So Shenzhen cannot just say that uh, I'm the best, I will continue to be the best. They have to face competition and work hard. Despite the issue of heavy investment into the uh, high technology areas, let me go back to uh, Haifeng. Uh, uh, Haifeng. Hello, Haifeng. Now, when we look at the competitive edge of uh, much of the uh, technology companies in Shenzhen, we have to draw a comparison between Shenzhen and the Silicon Valley in the United States, uh, where you see a big number of universities and uh, institutions of higher learning, whilst in Shenzhen you have just a, a small number of such uh, uh, universities. Uh, therefore, don't you think uh, in the case of Shenzhen we face more vulnerabilities? and? Uh, uh, less advantages compared with uh, the Silicon Valley in the United States? Well, I have to commit that there we do have a drawback in terms of the human capitals. And uh, like you said, Shenzhen lack of the top, uni top global universities. But I just read carefully about through the white papers. It is said that in the future, the government or the either local or central government should support Shenzhen to absorbing more top universities and research institutes globally and to the Shenzhen. And beyond that, I think to welcome the global talents is also important things. The good thing of Shenzhen, I think I can characterize in three points. One is good governance. The government always have long-term plan and strategies. And the second and most important is free flow of human capitals. When it is start as a small fishing villages, to build up today's giant cities, you know, top four cities in, 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 the, in the China, I think human capital plays important roles. So yes, I try to your point, we are lack of the top talent people, but we are getting to that. Whitman? Yeah, um, I think there's, uh, obviously it's a right comment, but if you look at Shenzhen today, they actually, they will have five very good universities. Okay, right now there's already three, there's two in the building, okay? And then, just 50 kilometers away, you have Hong Kong. And we have five of, the, uh, five of the top 100 universities in Hong Kong. 
So if you look at compare the Silicon Valley, it's almost like the same number of universities. You mean you have to look at the issue in the broad context of the 11 cities in this exactly. great Bay Area, exactly. and the universities in Hong Kong could benefit the development of. Hong However, Kong there's a few way. things. Um, let me see. Both sides have strength. Okay, in what the Silicon Valley has the strength, obviously the history, the talents pool already pooled, and most importantly, it's an attraction to global talents. If you look at Silicon Valley, look at all the technical people. Half of them are Asians. Okay, top is Indian, second is Chinese. Whereas if you look at the Great Bay Area, whether it's Shenzhen or all the other cities, we are all predominantly Chinese. Okay, to be a world-class innovation technology hub, you need to be able to attract global talents. And I've been proposing that we should at least have another seven million. Uh, international talents into the Great Bay areas, which is only like 10 percent of our population, <coughs> that would really change. But on the other hand, there are some strengths of um, Shenzhen compared to Silicon Valley. Is we have the whole value chain. Okay. Uh, sometimes I have jokes with my friends in the Silicon Valley. I say, why don't you come back? Because even if you invented something, you have still have to come to Shenzhen to get it made. Because we have the factories, we have all the supply chain materials from. Raw, raw materials to half-made materials to surface to mold, all these things within probably like 20 kilometers diameter you can find. I mean, uh, Wang Tang of DJI, that's why he expressed why he started in Shenzhen, because he has all the supply chain ready there. Whereas if you are in the Silicon Valley, chances are your supply chain will consist of both Shenzhen and Mexico. Okay, make it much harder to do the kind of intrusion that we can do in Shenzhen. Well, what about special policies to attract talented professionals? Uh, for example, um, many are still concerned about the household registration system, HUCO system. Uh, that means a lot for the younger generation of uh, university graduates uh, who care about their housing prices, uh, how their children could be educated properly there, medical uh, conditions uh, to ensure health. Now, we have a lot of these things in mind when uh, young people in particular consider their future in Shenzhen. That has a lot to do with whether the local government is able to provide uh, public service and public products. Uh, uh, Wei Wen, um, do you think this is a very important uh, to guarantee the special status of Shenzhen? Uh, actually, that's not that important. But if we look at Shenzhen, I worked in San Francisco for three years and uh, I worked quite a lot with uh, companies in Shenzhen, uh, in, sorry, in Silicon Valley. And the talents in Silicon Valley do not depend on the government for housing or for other things. Just, they just go to the market. The important thing is they find the Silicon Valley has enough potential, enough huge, uh, vast future for their development. And behind that, there's the huge world market because Silicon Valley is connected to the whole world. And what is more, uh, Silicon Valley has the very free market mechanism with the least government intervention, but with good government support. Also, there's a very good venture capital mechanism around the Silicon Valley. Out of the total world venture capital investment, America accounted for about 60%. And within America, Silicon Valley accounted for about 50%. So Silicon Valley is the hub of venture capital, which is very good, uh, very bad needed for Shenzhen and the Great Bay Area. Uh, Hai Feng, let me ask you uh, how you look at the issue of a rule of law uh, in Shenzhen, because if you want to set a very good example for the rest of the country, and indeed uh, 50 years from now or 40 years from now, if Shenzhen uh, aims to be a uh, one of the envies for other leading cities, uh, uh, cosmopolitan cities in the world, you have to abide by rule of law. And uh, that will also uh, guarantee fair play in the market economy, so to speak. Uh, are you confident about this? Generally speaking, yes. And uh, talking to a rule of law system kind of things, I think China is improving, especially in Shenzhen. One thing, I did write a, a development report for Greater Great Bay Area last year, the blue book about Great Bay Development Report. We're talking about the rule of law systems. In Shenzhen, actually, we try lots of things, like when we try to solving the international ambiguities, 
we, I mean, obviously China have China system, Western country has Western country system, but usually we can find a general accepted kind of the business practice to solve this ambiguity. For example, if we try to solving the ambiguity between the two, the trade between the two countries, we, well, we can try the arbitrations. This is one example, right? So, I mean, the, in well, uh, if you look at the uh, ambiguity, then the our Western, yeah. uh, skeptical Western uh, viewers and observers yeah. would be uh, left quite confused because the rule of law demands clarity, transparency, not ambiguity. Ambiguity goes against every bit of what it means uh, uh, when, it come to, when it comes to rule of law. Rule of law. Uh, Whitman, uh, is that true that uh, we must be very uh, careful with? Uh, what a high phone calls ambiguity. I ambiguity is a way of a Chinese thinking, but it's, yes. a, it's somehow controversial. It, and it goes against the international it way. It definitely of is against the rule of law. Yes. Um, I think what high was trying to is the differences between, for example, the common law and the continental law, but mm -hmm. the civil law. Um, I think uh, Shenzhen has done a good job in the past in terms of you know, promoting rule of law in terms of protecting uh, intellectual property, it's to its own advantage. Uh, or for example, in the Shanghai zone that I serve, we have a special arrangement for any Hong Kong related trade dispute can be trialed under Hong Kong law. Okay, and there's also arbitration center, international arbitration center of Shenzhen located inside Shanghai, uh -huh. where we have more than 40, about 40% 40 non-Chinese arbitrators. So it's getting there, but I think the, 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 it's glad, I'm glad you actually mentioned transparency. I think what Shenzhen really need now is transparency. Not the transparency about the law itself, but transparency, for example, on administration. If I apply for a license, how long does it take to approve? Under what criteria can it be approved or disapproved? Mm. Okay? This thing is really, in the whole of China, I find it very difficult to find such information, especially when I'm helping Hong Kong companies to come into Shenzhen. I sometimes have to ask a lot of questions and I still don't, do not get an answer. So I actually made a personal suggestion to the, actually to the party secretary of, of Shenzhen. I said transparency is the best um, prevention for corruption and also it's also a good cure for non-performance. So I think this is really the next step we want to do in Shenzhen is to promote transparency. Uh, we win, obviously, the idea of one country, two systems uh, has met serious setbacks in Hong Kong given the impact of the arrest uh, in this territory for the past few years. Now, when the central authorities in the Chinese mainland uh, raised the idea of uh, testing this principle of one country, two systems in Shenzhen, a special economic zone, what did the central government actually mean? Uh, I think the central government's test in Shenzhen is for socialism, not uh, one country, two systems. But the capitalist system is applied in Hong Kong, not Shenzhen. But in Shanghai, they apply some of the Hong Kong laws and some of the practices that prevail in Hong Kong. That's a good gateway linking the Great Bay Area. Uh, I think, of course, in Hong Kong, we can learn a lot of good lessons from the recent riots in Hong Kong. The other, the one thing among others is we adhere to two systems, but first we should adhere to one country. But many of the riots of many of their claims is uh, Hong Kong is different from the mainland. One Hong major reason be behind the arrest in Hong Kong is that most of the young uh, university graduates uh, find it difficult to find jobs, and the job market uh, uh, is quite limited in Hong Kong. Very quickly, uh, uh, Whitman, it's not you think uh, Shenzhen will provide young people from Hong Kong and Macau with good job opportunities? Yes, you know, unemployment rate is actually very low, 2.8. Now it just turned 2.9. So it's not a matter of number of jobs but the nature of the jobs mm -hmm. and also the future of the jobs. And I think in Shenzhen, what we provide, especially for those who are studying science and technology, really much larger opportunity than in Hong Kong. Thank you so much. With that, we come to the end of this very interesting and enlightening discussion about what the future might be like for Shenzhen in this great Bay Area that covers Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.